in the sermon series that we've been in, we've been talking about trees. Hence, if you haven't been here, uh, you kind of wonder why do we have all these tree stumps on the stage? It's just to set the setting um, that, that trees is something that God uses all throughout Scripture to teach us incredible principles. In fact, we've kind of discovered that the Bible starts with a tree and it actually ends with the tree. The Bible starts with a, Bible, with a tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and it actually ends with the tree of life, right? And all throughout Scripture, in between those trees, there are many other trees that we see that God uses to tell his greatest revelations to us, and today is no different. In fact, we're ending the series today, and next week we're starting a brand new series going to the book of Philippians for the next three or four months. And so looking forward to all that God's going to do and speak to us today. Hey, if you got your Bibles, turn with me to Luke chapter 13, verses 6 through 9. Luke chapter 13, verses 6 through 9. Um, I'm going to read a story, a parable. Um, and a parable are earthly stories to convey a heavenly truth. And uh, I think it's going to speak right to us. It says this, and he told the people this parable. A man had a fig tree planted. Everybody say planted. Planted in his vineyard. And he came seeking fruit on it and found none. And he said to the vine dresser, look, for three years now I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree. And I have found none. Cut it down, and why should it be used? Use up the ground that is in. Verse 8. And he, referring to the vine dresser, answered him, Sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and put on manure. Verse 9. And then, if it should bear fruit next year, well, good. But if it don't, then we can cut it down. So give it one more year. Lord, I pray for the next few moments that you may speak your word to us so clearly in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. Well, I'm excited to continue on in the series. I want to, we've been talking about trees. Last week, we talked about, uh, I think, was it a sycamore tree? We talked about the sycamore tree. We talked about the olive tree. <laughs> we talked about the wooden tree on Easter and we've been talking about all the different trees and how they apply to our lives. And today, I want to talk to you about a tree that is most common in New Palestine and in Palestine times. Uh, I want to talk to you about the fig tree. Now, a fig tree uh, doesn't have oftentimes the appearance of a tree. It has the appearance of a, a shrub, um, but it is categorized as a tree. And fig trees are really known in that area, and uh, they were known to grow in rocky ground, known to grow in different uh, places. And so I want to um, real quick get to that, and then we're going to have a child dedication towards the end of the service. So we've got a lot to go through today. It's going to be a great day. Um, I was thinking about just this tree and what that means for us, and going. the Lord brought me to this story um, of the Gospel of Luke, chapter 13, and verse verses 6 through 9, and this is a story that Jesus is responding to the issues of that day. Of that day, there was all type of issues that they were dealing with. One issue was uh, people that was in the temple selling stuff, and so the temple had became a marketplace instead of a holy place, and the people of God, they started to profit off of God's people, and they started to use religion as a means to be as a stepping stone for their own lives. And so, so God was, uh, wanted to share a story to address that issue and to let them know that uh, this is a story about a fig tree and that fig trees are supposed to produce figs. And Christians are also supposed to produce fruit, right? So, like, if you're going to claim to be a fig tree, then go ahead and produce figs. But if you're going to claim to be a Christian then you also have the right and a responsibility to produce as well. So here in this story, what we recognize is that there is a man, the Bible says that he planted this tree in his vineyard. Now, when you plant something versus something that's kind of been there from the beginning, there's a different expectation that you have for a tree or a plant that you plant, right? 
right? When you plant something in your yard, you actually want it to do well. And some of you have trees that was already there before you move into your house, and so it's no big deal. But when you plant something, there's a different expectation, especially a farmer. A farmer, when they plant something, they put so much energy and so much resources into the plant that they want a return on its investment. So when you think about a farmer, what they do, they go, they, they buy the soil, they buy the nutrients for the soil, they spend the money on the water, they, they, they spend the money for the crops or the seed or the plant. They, they put so much resources into its plants. And so they expect that the plant should give them some type of return on its investment. And one day you and I, we're going to stand before God And he's going to ask, what did you produce with the life that I've given you? One day we're going to have to stand before God and he's going to want his return on his investment in your life today. And by the way, we are expensive. Everybody say, I'm expensive, y'all. You may not have Louis Vuitton or Gucci or whatever name brand that that stuff represents. I'm a Marshalls guy. Come on, somebody. (laughs) And even when I go to Marshalls, I like that one designer. You know that one designer, Clearance? Come on, somebody. It, it really don't really matter what you got on, but there, you, there been, there's been a high price paid for your life. And that price was the son of the living God who was in heaven, who came to this earth and lived this life on your behalf. Meaning this, because your life, your, your salvation was so expensive, God just wants some type of return on his investment in your life today. So what he's saying today, fig trees produce figs, Christians should produce as well. And today I want to talk to you about what that means for us and how we live a life that we produce fruit today. I'm reminded, I just kind of feel, and sometimes I forget that one day I'm going to have to stand before God and he's going to ask me, what did I do with my money? What did I do with my marriage? What did I do with my kids? What did I do with this church? What did I do with my house? Everything that he's given me, I'm going to have to stand before God. And I just have this sneaky suspicion. This is not Bible or whatever, but I like to put myself in the scriptures. I just feel like when we stand before God, we're going to be in a garden. And he's going to be hanging out. And there's going to be an apple tree right there. And, and like literally, he's going to pick an apple from the apple tree. And he's going to talk to the tree. Thank you for my fruit. And then he's going to talk to us with, while he's chewing. <laughs> Don't y'all love people talk to you while you're chewing? <laughs> I had an uncle who did that all the time. Hey, boy, go over there. <laughs> That's funny, y'all. That's funny, y'all. Let me finish showing. I got a feeling that he's going to have an apple in his hand. Chewing. And thanking the tree for its producing its fruit. And then he's going to look at your life and ask you, where's his fruit? He's going to look at your marriage. He's going to look at your your money. Look at your career, your talents. Look at your giftings. And ask you, what did you produce with the fruit that I put on the inside of you? It's almost like he's going he's gonna to want to pick the, the goodness out of your life. And he's going to ask you, what did you produce with the life that I've given you? Because remember, we have been planted by God. In fact, the Bible talks about all throughout scriptures that we won't just like randomly drop here on this earth. No, 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 no. God planted us here on this earth so that we can produce. Because Christians, they produce figs, they produce So here in this story, there's a story of this fig tree that's been taking up soil and, quite honestly, taking up space. And Jesus is telling this story about how the owner of the vineyard has come back into town. And the owner says, every time I come here looking for figs from this tree, I don't see anything. And it's almost like he's talking to the church right now, by the way. Like, every time I come to your life, All I see is idleness. All I see is laziness. All I see is you laying back and not spending your time and your energy on the important things and only on the urgent things. 
It's because oftentimes in life, especially us believers, we spend the majority of our time going after the urgent but look and leave me behind the important. In fact, how, I like how one uh, philosopher says it. He says it like this. We have two type of problems. We have the urgent problems, and then we have the important problems. The urgent problems are not that important. And the important problems never seems to be urgent to us. And we got to learn that there are, there are some things that we're going to have to stand before God, and he's going to ask us, what did you produce? And I want to I just real quick talk to you today about four areas how you can be a fruit producer. I don't want you to be a fig tree that God comes back and looking and asking, what did you produce? And there's nothing to show for. In fact, I want to, I want to give you four areas. Uh, and if you do these areas, you will be a massive fruit producing company production that God's going to use to make a difference in the world. Number one is this. If you want to be a fruit producer, number one, you got to learn how to serve. Learn how to serve. Serve your family. Serve at your job. This is a kingdom principle. In fact, I like what the Bible says in Matthew. If you're going to be the greatest in this kingdom, you first need to be a servant. Because in this kingdom, the greatest is not the preacher, by the way. The greatest is not the person with the mic or the light shining on him. The greatest is not those who have the nice clothes on. The, the, the greatest is not the loudest or, or even the person with the most money. The greatest in this kingdom that you and I get to be a part of is those who serve. And I just got a sneaky suspicion that some of us, we, are, we think so highly of ourselves that we don't want to serve. Can I tell you in this kingdom, and by the way, this is a principle that you can use that's biblical, a biblical principle, but it could be used in, in your career or your profession. If you want to move up in any organization, be the greatest servant. And watch how God blesses you and move forward. And I think that every day we should clock in mentally, like when we get up and open up our eyes and say, God, I'm ready today to serve somebody today. Every day we should serve. I think this, that we lose our way when we don't serve. We, we lose our mind when we don't serve. We, we stray off into sin when we don't serve. God is calling all of us to be the greatest servants in the world. He's calling us to be the servants because that's what Christians do. When, when you look at Christians, we produce serving in fact, Jesus is the son of God, and he's known for his power, and he's God himself. And yet, one of the greatest models of Jesus is that he was washing people's feet because Jesus did not care about a title, but he picked up a towel. And I just think that it is so important that you and I learn to Sir, last night I was here about 10 o'clock. Normally I come here and rehearse the sermon, rehearse everything that I'm saying to you right now. And as I was leaving, I noticed some, some stains on the concrete as you come into the building. So I got me some Lysol and I got a little brush and I'm scrubbing out there last night, just scrubbing. And one of my friends who's a pastor called me and he asked me, he said, what are you doing? I said, bro, I'm actually at the church. Uh, just, I'm scrubbing the, the front concrete area. And he says, bro, do you got anyone in your church to do that? And I said, I kind of do. I, our church loves to serve. But I told him, serving is never beneath me. Like, like, I just want to let you know, like, you, I don't care how much God bless you. If, if, if you're too big to serve, then you're too small to lead. And you got to learn that you have to be a servant of all. In fact, I'll, I'll say this right now. Serving is the secret, the secret ingredient that God wants to use in your life so that you can produce the fruit that God wants from you today. You got to learn how to serve. And oftentimes in our culture, everybody wants them to be served. But guess what? God says this, I didn't come to be served, but I came to serve. And I think that's the, that's the model that we all have as a church. We should all have this, right? Don't y'all agree with me? Don't we all should be serving? Somebody say, sign me up. Sign me up. All right, yeah, we got engaged in a couple weeks, and uh, 
sign up there. You can sign. <laughs> That's a good one. I got got them. <laughs> We got to serve, right? I, I think there's some enemies to serving, by the way. There's three enemies. Real quick, I want to hit. And the, the three enemies of serving is this busyness. You are so busy that your schedule have no time to serve nobody else. And some of you got to get set free from the idol of busyness, right? And you have no space in your life to serve other people. Secondly, self-centeredness. I think you're so focused on you that you lose sight of serving others. This is, by the way, this is like marriage talk. This is parenting talk. This is work talk. This is financial talk. This is every talk right here when it comes to you producing fruit. Because when you're so, like when I come home, my mindset should be not how long a day I had at work, not how many stressful meetings I had, not how I'm going to raise the money for a building, uh, balance the budget for this church, love on people walking through hard stuff. My mind should be when I come home, how am I going to serve my wife? How am I going to serve my kids? Because if I have a mindset, and I just got to set some husbands free real quick from this mindset, that when you get home, that your wife's supposed to be serving you, that they need to have food ready and the house clean. No, no, no. We're going to debunk that idea, right? Because we as leaders, especially men, real quick, let me just, let me go on a rabbit trail real quick. Rap, 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 rabbit trail. Hey, it, we're called to be the, the lead servants of our house, right? And so you have an expectation so for someone to serve you all the time, then you're not in the will of God because God calls us to get on our knees and, and to wash dirty feet. And God calls us to put down our, our title and pick up a towel so that we can love people and serve people. And that's why, by the way, in here in this church, we don't really emphasize titles here because guess what? We're all on the same level, y'all. We are all servants of the Most High God. I might be on this stage, but trust me, I will get off this stage and set up some chairs, y'all. Come on, somebody. I love setting up chairs. No Michael out chair set me, y'all. Come on, somebody. <laughs> And I just think that we got to bring a joy back to serving because the Bible says this, that when we serve, we got to serve with joy and gladness in our heart. I don't want you to serve while you being mean. Some of y'all serve mean, y'all. Anybody got serving mean people? I ain't going to lie. Sometimes at the house, I serve mean. You know, I, I'm tired and really like, go, 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 go do those, those dishes. <sighs> Open up the dishwasher. I'm the only one around here working. You know how when you want to make a point, you want to be loud at the, at the chore that you're doing, and you breathe hard, like, ugh. What I'm trying to say, like, literally, what I'm trying to say is that when you serve, be glad to serve. Yes, yeah, sign me up to serve. And I just, want to, I just want to encourage you that busyness, self-centeredness, and lastly, another enemy is comfort. Serving and comfort does not mix with each other. If you want to be comfortable, then you can't serve right? Serving puts you in a season, in a position of discomfort. And I just want to tell you right now, if I, I think it's important that you serve at home, you serve at work, and you serve in your local church. Whatever your local church is, you got to serve. You can't just come thinking you want to receive, and you don't serve. There's a blessing in the serving. In fact, the, the fruit that's in your life, that's in you, comes through serving. Everybody say serving. Okay, secondly, it's this. It's generosity, you want, to, you want to produce fruit? Learn how to be a generous, live a, have a generous lifestyle. And, and what I mean by that is this, is Acts chapter 20, verses 35, it says this, in everything I did, I showed you uh, that this kind of hard work, uh, we must help the weak. Remembering the words of our Lord Jesus himself when he said, it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. So like, just to kind of take that scripture for what it is. What it's saying is that the blessing is not found in the receiving. We all been taught, oh, I'm going to sow a seed, and then I'm going to get a blessing, right? But the blessing is not in the, in the return. The blessing is in the giving. Because when you give, the blessing actually multiplies. And then it comes back even greater on you. 
So, but like the actual start of the blessing starts not when you receive, but when you give. Because this idea of generosity introduced to us a principle of multiplication. Because you are called to multiplication. I like how Tony Evans says it in his commentary. Tony Evans says this, that whenever you live a generous lifestyle, you now tap yourself in into the principle and to the spirit of multiplication. When you're stingy, you have addition, which means you, you get paid every week and you, get, you just add and add, right? But when you are generous, you get multiplication. And for a season, multiplication and stinginess look the, and, 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 and addition look the same. Two plus two equals four. Two times two equals the same thing. Two plus three equals two times three equals Here's what happens. You start to grow faster at a faster rate than people around you. And this is what Tony Evans says when it comes to generosity, because generosity has never been about how much you have and how much you don't have. Generosity has always been about the condition of your heart and how your heart is conditioned. And can I tell you right now, we think that when we get more, we will be more generous. There's a lie of the enemy that says, when I make it big, that's when I'm going to start giving big. But that's a lie from the enemy to keep you stuck in your same merry-go-round of struggle. Because what I'm telling you right now, if you want fruit in your life, you have to be generous at a young age. That's why I teach my kids about generosity, teach them about giving. Because if you want to stay stuck, keep believing the lie that you're going to give when you get rich. No, 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 no. You got to give even in doing the process, even when you're making, not making much. Here's why. Because generosity opens the door for fruit bearing to happen in your life like nothing else. It's time for us to open up our hands and be generous with our, with our time, to be generous with our resources, to be generous at work, to be gener- a generous people. We are called to be a generous people. So we got serving. We got generosity. The, the next area that, we're gonna, we, that we need in our lives, if we're going to produce fruit and not be like a fig tree, is this, is love and compassion. We've got to be a little more loving today. Can I tell you, like, lately, I am running across a lot of mean Christians. Has anybody, no, you ever met a mean Christian? They're actually meaner than worldly people. They are, I mean, they will shout in church and be so mean at home. Can I tell you, like, we are not called to be mean. We're called to be loving and compassionate. And guess what? Our love for the world is not based off of what the world believes, where they came from, what race they are, what they look like, their background, how much money they have. Our love for the world comes from God in us. And we love everybody without discrimination today. I think we're getting real mean. Like, I, I went to a conference the other day. I was in, I forgot, was, I was in Phoenix a couple of weeks ago, and we're hanging out in Phoenix. Is that my phone? Oh, my gosh. That's my phone, y'all. I'm so sorry. Uh, was somebody calling me, Katie? Oh, man. I'm about to say, I mean, a couple of weeks ago, my mom was calling me while I'm preaching the sermon. You know, like, I'm like, come on. Um, <laughs> thanks, he butt down me. But what I'm trying to tell you right now is that I was, I was in Phoenix the other day, and I was, I was hanging out with, at this conference. This was like a conference of leaders and pastors. And uh, so we're hanging out. And, um, you know, and before, this, you guys know my personality. I like to work the room. I like to work the crowd. And there's, you know, a few thousand people in there, but I like to get the sense of the room. And I'm in the West Coast, and West Coast is way different from East Coast. And so uh, I just want to get the vibe of the, of the room and what type of room I have. You know, I want to know if they're going to talk back to me or is this going to be one of those, like, silent presentations. So I'm cool with either or. And so, I'm, and again, this is pastors and leaders. And so this is a couple that I came across, and, and, and uh, I had my coffee in the hand. I was mic'd up with this same mic right here. And, and I went them with my coffee in the hand and said, hey, how you doing? We're good. Okay. It's West Coast. You know, West Coast is a little bit different from East Coast. I'm from the South, so I, I get it. 
I understand my personality, so I, I, I got to work my way to this, this couple. I say, where are you guys from? Because they're all, all, all over uh, Arizona. Where are you guys from? Flagstaff. Okay, Flagstaff. Okay. All right, cool. What do y'all do? We're pastors. Cool. <laughs> you excited to be here? It's going to be a good night. It's going to be a good conference. It sure will. And I just took that as a sign. <laughs> they don't want to talk to me. <laughs> I take those signs real late, y'all. <laughs> after the service, I, 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 no, I, I, I speak, and after the service, uh, I see that the, the wife has her hand raised during, like, the, the altar moment. I mean, she wasn't fully this, but at least I got her right here. And uh, so she's right here, and so after this, I saw her, and so afterwards, I came up and said, man, I hope you all, you know, you know and enjoy it. And I wasn't looking for any type of feedback from my sermon, um, I was just hoping they just enjoyed the, the environment, the, the, the night. Uh, and she says, your presentation, you know, and I preach a sermon, so I, it wasn't like a presentation for a business. It was like a sermon. But she called my sermon a presentation. So anyway, <laughs> so I knew it was going downhill from there. <clears throat> she says, your presentation, it wasn't that good. <laughs> I'm like, man, this, this, like, this is like actually like pastors of church, you know what I'm saying? Like, even if I did bad, it just encouraged me. You know what I'm saying? Like, just tell me, hey, you did good, brother. You did good, brother. God bless that, brother. God bless you. You know what I'm saying? And I just feel like we're living in a culture where there's so many Christians that have no love and no compassion. And can I tell you, if you're going to if you're gonna claim to be a follower of Jesus, then you need to have the love of Jesus as well. It's like Jesus staying here in this story. Hey, if you're going to be a fig tree, then produce figs. And if you're going to be a Christian, then you got to love. Next is this. Last, my last point is this. Is this. Not only do we need to serve, we got to be generous. We got to have love and compassion. But then lastly, I want to focus on this for the majority of the time. Is that I want to talk to you about repentance today. You got to produce serving, produce generosity, produce love, and produce repentance. Here's what this, the crux of the matter here in this text. Um, this is the, the gospel of Luke, and Luke has been from the beginning of his gospel talking to us about producing fruit of repentance, meaning this, that if you're going to call yourself a Christian, then there should be a, a fruit of repentance in your life, meaning this, that, that like if you're going to say, Lord, Lord, then you got to repent. Here's what the Bible says in Luke chapter 3, verses 8, and I'm going to read from the New Living Translation today. It says this, prove by the way you live that you have repented of your sins and then turn to God. Don't just say to one another, we're safe, for we are descendants of Abraham. That means nothing. I tell you, God can create kids of, of Abraham from these very stones. Here, here's what I'm talking about real quick. Real quick, what it's talking about is that, that there's people that say, Oh, we're Christians and we love God. But when you look at their life, you look at how they treat people, you look at how they manage their resources, manage their families, there is no fruit that they're Christians. Nothing at all. You see nothing at all. And John the Baptist and even Jesus is saying, hey, 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 if you say that you repent, then there should be some evidence of your repentance. There, like if you say, hey, I, and because what repentance means is to turn around. It means literally you're going one direction and literally you turn around. And the story of the fig tree is that, is that there, there, there are people who's claiming the name of God but not living in the ways of God. And they're not producing what God wants us to produce, which is repentance. And it simply means you go in one direction and you turn around. You are talking one type of way, and when you repented of nasty talking, you turned around. You was wilding out, sleeping around, People with not your wife or with your husband, and, and you repented and you turned around. Can I tell you right now, it is time for all of us, including me, in the areas of my life 
Well, I have not repented. It's time for all of us to turn around. It's time to turn around. Turn around from your unforgiveness. Turn around from your bitterness. Turn around from your way we're living. Turn around from your selfish living. Turn around from your pride. Turn around because it's in your turning that you start to produce fruit in your life that you've never seen before, everybody. All right, real quick, let me, let me give you just a quick lesson. So what, what they do here in Eastern Palestine, they're talking about figs, and, and they knew this in that time. We don't really know this in our time because we don't really spend much time with fig trees. But in that time, Eastern Palestine fig trees, there will be long seasons where they didn't produce. And there will be a, a saying of the rabbi when it came to the fig trees. And that saying would be, the fruit is inside of the tree. The fruit was inside of the tree. And it's a saying that they, they kind of knew that it, it was like, hey, you may not see it, but it's in there somewhere. And it's almost like in that time, Jesus was telling the church, hey, stop living this way. Stop having my temple be a market. Hey, stop claiming my name without, without producing the fruit. But just so that you know, the fruit is inside your life. The fruit that you, that God wants to bear out of your life is in you already. It's not some external thing that comes in the tree. No, no, no. When you plant the tree, a mango tree or apple tree or an orange tree, you plant it and there's nothing there. But guess what? The seed of the fruit is already inside the tree, even though you can't see the fruit. And God told me here today to remind you that you may not see the miracles of God. You may not see the fruit of God. You may not see progress in your life. You may not see progress in your marriage. You may not see progress in your finances. You may not see progress in your career. But guess what, baby? It's on the inside of you somewhere. It's on the inside of you. You don't have to worry because it's in you today. It's in you. Everybody say, it's in me. It's in you. But my favorite part of this narrative of the fig tree, favorite part. So, like, the owner was like, hey, man, we got to do something about this. Like, this is, it's not producing. We need to cut this thing down. And in the Bible, the owner could be related to God. But the vine dresser, the one who was tending to the garden, said to the owner, could you just give me one more year? Give me one more year. And come back. And I feel like that's exactly what God says, what Jesus says to God every day. The Bible says that he make forth intercession on our behalf, meaning this, that right now Jesus is at the right hand of God, rubbing God's shoulders like give him one more year. And then when that year runs out, he says back to God, give them one more more year because guess what because God wants to continue to give you the grace of God but one day that grace will be over and so while we're in the period of grace God is saying to you and I you have we have one more chance one more opportunity for us to live out the calling of God that's over our life. You and I have one more year because of the grace of God. And I'm not talking about a literal year. I'm just saying that you have another life, another chance. And the Bible talks about when you accept Christ, you are now born again into a new life. And so you have another chance to be the fruit bearing person that God is requiring from his church today. One more and today, I feel like there's some people here today, you walked into this room thinking it's all over. I messed up. You walked in here today, it was like, I, it's, I got no more time left. I screwed it all up. I can't produce a fruit. And the grace of God has come to this church this morning to remind all of us, including me, you have one more year, one more chance. The grace of God never runs old. And guess what? When that year runs out, he's going to go to God and like, give me another one. Give me another one. Here's why. Because the grace of God never runs out. 
But God is saying to us as a warning, you're going to stand before God with your life. And when you stand before him, make sure you have fruit to produce to him and to his glory and to his hand. Amen, somebody? Come on, can we give God a hand clap of praise today? Come on, would you stand to your feet today?